welcome all of you. Uh, to some of you, it's uh, late in the evening. It's uh, not yet dawn here in California where I'm speaking from. Uh, but I had had a cup of coffee, so I should be able to get through this, and hopefully you will uh, get your evening uh, uh, tea or wine uh, to listen. Um, what I'm speaking about today is old news. This is a field project that took place in Afghanistan in the 1970s, but has never been published. And um, even though I have a gray beard, I was one of the field archeologists, I was a very junior field archeologist on that project at that time. I'm in the process of getting it published now. And because it has not been published, uh, it's unknown to most of the community. And uh, because of the fact that there has been so little work done in Afghan Sistan, uh, it still is fairly important, even though the data itself is very old. So hopefully I'll be able to give you something of an outline of what Afghan Sistan uh, looked like in the Bronze Age and the early Iron Ages, uh, based upon what we did 40 years ago. Obviously there's been a lot of work done since then, but not a lot, a lot in this area. I do have to apologize for the fact that I do not read Farsi. And so a lot of the material that has come out uh, by Iranian scholars on the Iranian side of Sistan, I, am not, I have not been able to read um, the stuff in material in English, yes, but not material in Farsi. And also, uh, given the times that we're in, I can only wish the best for the, uh, uh, the state of Afghanistan and for the Afghan people, given the difficulties they are going in and have been going in for many decades. No uh, project uh, is a single person's activity. And even though uh, I was involved in this one, uh, I was not the PI. There's a man named William Trousdale, who was a curative, curator at the Smithsonian um, and who lives in Los Angeles now and is retired. Uh, was the head of this project. And of course, there are many other people involved in the project and many of the people who facilitated the, the ability for that project to take place. So I want to acknowledge at least a few of them uh, here, uh, and particularly uh, uh, for this particular paper, uh, Eric Hubbard is a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania who helped me do some of the research that, that uh, led to uh, the talk today. But uh, as, as you can see, there are many others. Um, Many of you will know a lot about Sistan. Uh, the Afghan side of Sistan is uh, the end of the Helmand River, which starts in eastern Afghanistan and ends in the Hamun Lakes, which border the two countries. Um, we know a lot about the Bronze Age of Sistan in Iran from the work that have been done by many scholars uh, and are still being done today. Uh, we also know a lot about southern Afghanistan, for example, areas like Mundig the Mundigak area, um, Demarasa Gunde, Said Kalatepe, and so on and so forth. And also as, the, as time goes on, we have been learning much more about uh, uh, Baluchistan, much more about Turkmenistan, Central Asia, and more about Eastern Iran that have filled in the gaps of what the Bronze Age looked like in this area. But somewhere along the way, the, the term the Helmand civilization came about. And um, the Helmand civilization would be the area largely around the Helmand River. And because of the fact that so little work has been done in the Helmand Valley, it's hard to know what the, Sel the Helmand civilization looks like without actually knowing what is in the Helmand Valley. And that's where our project, the Helmand Sistan project took place. We had five field seasons in the 1970s and then five additional study seasons following that. And we um, covered the area from Lashkarga all the way to the Hamun Lakes, uh, up and down the Helmand River several times in the area to the east called Sarotar, to the area in the west and the south toward the Pakistani and the Iranian borders. And the work that we have done is what I wanna talk about today to see if we can fill in some of those gaps of what this Helmand uh, civilization looked like. The Helmand Sistan project was a joint project between the Smithsonian National Museum of the United States and the Afghan Institute of Archaeology. They were uh, co-sponsors uh, with us uh, and the Afghan representative, uh, Ulam Rahman Amari, uh, worked with us almost every season and has been responsible for several publications as well. Unfortunately, Mr. Amari is no longer with us to be able to contribute to uh, the discussion today. Even though there had been other people who had gone to Sistan prior to us, Afghan Sistan, ours was the first long-term region-wide survey and excavation project in this region. Uh, we could not cover everything in this amount of time. We are talking about, after all, about 40,000 square kilometers. Uh, I was involved in this project. I was a first year graduate student. I was 23 years old and on my second field project uh, and got a lot of uh, archeology span done in the two seasons of the five that we were there. 
But what that does tell you now, uh, after returning from Sistan the second time, I went into scholarly publishing and uh, never went back to Afghanistan. So uh, my knowledge of the country and my knowledge of the material is uh, somewhat sketchy because I spent 40 years as a scholarly publisher and only in the last few years have come back to this study. So even though I have a gray beard looking like a lot of the other gray beards who have already spoken for this series, uh, I, I am still a student of all this and I really would appreciate uh, help in a lot of places for those of you who know a lot more than I do about this. My, the uh, principal investigator, uh, Dr. Trousdale, Bill, Bill Trousdale, um, worked for the Smithsonian and retired about 20 years ago. He now lives in California and he is 91 years old and is still working on this project. We, have, uh, we spoke yesterday, in fact, about, uh, about my presentation today. Um, obviously, we could not do any further field work after 1979 and the Soviet invasion uh, and the warfare that have gone on since then uh, was the end of our project, which is why there has been no further updates. It also helps explain why we did not publish the work in a timely fashion. Uh, Bill had always hoped to go back to Afghanistan. There are lots of loose ends that we have not finished. He also wanted to publish it in a single volume or a single set of volumes. I know many of you have had the frustration of trying to find some article about a project that was published in some festschrift somewhere, which is not the same as the other publications for that same project and can't collect all the material for one project together. Bill's idea was to publish all this in one piece. And as it was not published earlier, we have not had it at all. So um, I'm working on that and I'll tell you about that at the end, but uh, uh, that is part of an excuse and an apology for this material still being fugitive and not, uh, uh, very well known to the, the community. Um, anyway, this is what we looked like in 1974 and also what we look like today, we're close to today. The project was an interdisciplinary one and included not only the archeological component, but also we had ethnographic, ethnographic work that was done by uh, Mr. Amari, who was our Afghan partner, uh, who did a uh, extensive ethnography of the, uh, of the region and the people in the region uh, that was published last year by Bergan. And also, um, uh, uh, John Whitney, our field geologist, has published a, a piece and, and we'll have more work in the volumes as we publish them. But there's also a, a U.S. government uh, publication about the, uh, the geology of, uh, of Sistan. In our survey, our five years of survey, we discovered almost 200 sites. And here's a, a, rough, uh, a rough look at those. Um, most of them along the Helmand Valley, a large number of them were in the Sistan region which is to the east of the Helmand Delta. And we also went uh, twice toward the border and found some of the sites and refound some of the sites that have been visited by previous scholars that we will talk, I'll talk about also. Uh, from that, we built a chronology for the region. Most of it's based upon work that other people have already done. Uh, obviously, I'll be focusing today on the first two parts, the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. In Afghan Sistan, the Helmand Valley is generally fairly narrow, somewhere between two and five kilometers wide until it reaches the Delta that widens out into these Hamun lakes, which is where the, where the uh, river ends. It is surrounded on most sides by deserts, uh, the Dashti Margo to the east, the, Reg the Registan to the south, D Dashti Lut to the west, and therefore is a very important uh, communication and transport channel between the various different uh, civilizations or cultures around it, from uh, uh, Central Asia, from Iran, from Mesopotamia, and from the Indus. Important ge uh, geologically is the fact that there is a constant wind in Sistan that comes from the northwest. And in the summer, there's what's called the wind of 120 days, which is so strong that it bring picks up the sand, picks up the dust, and blows very hard, 30, 50, 70, 100 kilometers an hour uh, daily, along with extreme heat, which makes it a very difficult place to live and an also a very difficult place to do archaeology. You can see what it has done to the landscape here, for example, and what it does to uh, pieces of pottery that are left on the surface, all of which were probably originally ridgeware, like uh, ribware, like one at the bottom. My best example of that is one uh, area we, we had uh, lots of Parthian pottery and a bunch of square, uh, uh, stone squares that we believe was cemetery. So we dig to try to find uh, a grave uh, from Parthian period and realized once we started that we were underneath what was the ground soil, the, underneath the bottom of the grave because all we found was virgin soil there. 
So it's very likely that in the succeeding 2000 years, there had been at least a couple of meters of dirt that had been blown away and all that remained was the heavy stones that could not be blown by the wind. As a countervailing uh, environmental factor, there's the river, the Helmand River, which we know from historical records, uh, both in medieval times and in modern times, uh, the Helmand River flooded every spring, flooded the, the Delta area and brought in meters and meters of, uh, of silt and dirt and sand into, into the valley. Um, we demonstrated that in one of our excavations, which I'll talk about later, a site called Latkala over here on the right, where we dug four meters below the base of a, a tepe and was, we're still finding um, cultural materials down at the bottom where, the, where my colleague uh, Chip is standing. The river itself uh, irrigate the valley, but to get any further than the, the few kilometers nearby, one requires uh, uh, dams and canals. And there are elaborate canal systems throughout the Helmon Delta in all directions, going east, going west, going north, going south, that are uh, uh, controlled by dams that have been on the, on, the, on the Helmon, and we know historically have been there forever. We're not the first to work here. Some very well-known names to, uh, to you will be there. Oral Stein, uh, George Dales, uh, 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 Walter Fairservice are all people who will be well-known to you. The first uh, serious work was done by, the, uh, by a man from the British Boundary Commission there in the, the early part of the 20th century. And then some more recent scholars like uh, Norman Hammond, who's fortunately here today, uh, whose work is very important for this region. As a result, uh, when you look at this, you, you see there's not a lot that we know about the Bronze Age. Here is the result of all the sites that we found, which are the little dots in red, and the sites that were known previously from previous researchers. As you can see, it's a huge river valley, but there's very little in the way of Bronze Age sites that are known. And this is uh, one of the puzzles that we, I'll be talking about for, for our, our, our talk later today. Let me start first uh, at the area that borders on Iran, which is the area uh, closest to Shadi Sokhte and other sites that uh, many of you are familiar with. And that in fact, uh, there have been several talks about earlier here in this series, um, in the series of, of seminars. So this, the Rudi Biaban is a waterway that leads from the Helmand River, it is now dry, it goes west into Iran, where it runs into another waterway called the Shila Rud, which goes south, and they all empty out into a large uh, basin called the Godizira, which is largely uh, empty. There are several, some years there's some water in it, but usually, usually not. It's an overflow from the Hamun lakes that are on the border between Iran and Afghanistan. Um, there are a number of archeological sites that were known there uh, that have been studied by others. We added a few more, but let me talk about those first because they're very largely connected to the uh, Bronze Age material that is known from Iran and therefore would be familiar to, to, uh, to most of you. Uh, the first uh, scholar to have found this stuff obviously was Oral Sign, who just discovered Shadi Sokhte and a, a bunch of other sites that he called the Ramrud sites were at the, the, the confluence of where the Rudi Biaban hits the Shila Rud in, uh, in uh, Eastern Iran. And he found what he called were calcolithic pottery, uh, which, is, which is, has turned into the, our study of the Bronze Age in Eastern Iran. Uh, Walter Fursevis went there a couple of, uh, well, close to a half a century later, and his project, he actually walked the Rudi Biaban, this whole waterway that goes from the Helmand River uh, all the way to Iran. He walked huge parts of it and spent an entire week on foot looking for archeological sites. And surprisingly, he found almost none. There are a couple of sites on the Western edge of it that he found, but this whole large waterway, which was supposedly, and he claimed himself that was the, the, the channel of the Helmand River in the Bronze Age, there are almost no archeological sites along it. Um, Rafael Bissioni has gone back and looked at his material more recently and said that he missed a few sites. There's another seven or eight that he found there. But even then, if given what we know of the density of sites in Iran, the fact that there's so little in the Rio Biaban is puzzling. And I don't really have an answer for that, but I would welcome your thoughts on it. Perseverance not finding very much there, moved a little bit further south to an area called the Gardan Reg, where he found uh, a dozen sites or so um, that were very clearly Bronze Age sites, uh, including some burials and some pottery, again, that looks very similar to the stuff that you find at Charlie Stuff. 
George Dales went back uh, two days, two decades after uh, Fair Service was there, and again surveyed a lot, a lot of the same area. He came up with a site that he called Dom, which has been published. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It is a um, modern Muslim cemetery, including this one elaborate grave there, but that it has Bronze Age materials all over it. Um, he then went about another dozen kilometers north of that to a site called Gudari Shah, in which he found uh, material that at that time was known only from uh, Tepe Hisar, uh, these sm small columns, these handled stones, large discs, and so on and so forth, uh, that are known from what is called BMAC or the uh, uh, Greater Khorasan culture, which is what uh, the Sioni and Bagdati now call it. Um, we went back to this area, but only very briefly for uh, two visits in 1975 and 1976. We found one tepe there, called uh, Gina Kuna, that is uh, that had a couple of pieces that looked like they might be Bronze Age. Uh, we looked at uh, 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 Dales's collection from that same site. We found a couple more. So this is probably another Bronze Age site along the Rudy B. Bomb. But still, knowing what we have, what people have seen in Iranian Sistan, the fact that you find these sites covered with uh, uh, Bronze Age pottery everywhere is not something that, that has been found in the Rudy B. Bond by now three different research teams. We also went back to Dale's a site called Dam, which our local uh, guide, who is uh, one of the village Hans, called, is, said the name of it was Haima Barang. And yes, we found the same site, the same cemetery, but uh, we found uh, Bronze Age ceramics all over the site and did a substantial collection, which I'll show you a little bit about now. Uh, again, these are all uh, grayware and uh, painted buffware types of material that is known from, um, uh, from Sari Sokhta and known from Iranian Sistan. Uh, these things should look familiar to most of you from uh, Sari Sokhta 2, 3, and 4. Uh, we also found basket impressed bases, which is a, a style that is known from the Indo-Iranian borderlands. Uh, there's a, here's one from Sarai Kola, so some, some parallels. There are also other ones found throughout, uh, uh, throughout this region. And also uh, a, set, a different kind of uh, basket uh, impressed ware on, this, on the sides, which uh, Benjamin Boutin has called uh, basket ware, in which the basket is actually made in the Pottery is actually made inside a basket, and so the basket uh, impressions are all over the pottery. We found both of these kinds of things. And again, these are fairly well known from the Indo-Iranian borderlands. We also found here on the left what might be an inscription. And those of you who are uh, experts here on, on uh, uh, Proto-Elamite um, might be able to give us some guide as to whether this is a, uh, just a decoration of some sort, or whether this might be some kind of lettering. Dales, when he was there, found two similar ones. These, uh, tri these uh, uh, sets of triangles. So the ones on the right are Dales's and the one on the left, a very different kind of ware uh, was found by us. But it, now we have three of them. So there's, some, there's something there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Again, I'm not, I don't know enough about the, uh, uh, the paleography to be able to give you some idea of what, of what this might be. We also found lots of bronze, uh, travertine vessels. Again, Dales found the same. Uh, lots of copper slag. Uh, we know we're in a copper production area, and I'll talk about that a bit more in just a moment. Um, seals, which are common for this area, we found one bronze seal, uh, which is uh, uh, shaped like a bird. There are, again, uh, similar ones known from the region. Uh, one from Spide, which is uh, in the Jasmurian, is probably the closest parallel we found. Um, and then some bone seals, which also are in very similar types to what are known from the region. Uh, in fact, uh, George Dales found one of these uh, in his, his study of, uh, of, uh, of this, this particular uh, area. But again, these are not uncommon uh, uh, kinds of seals and we found these at, uh, at Dom. We moved also to Godari Shah and went back and found the same uh, 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 shrine to a, a Islamic holy man with all of the uh, uh, late Bronze Age uh, stone things on top. But note Godari Shah is not located on the flat surface like everything else. It's on a mound that's about five meters high and 60 meters in diameter. And we can only assume that this is some kind of human uh, construction. And so we don't really know what's underneath there. And of course, we just surveyed it for briefly for part of one day. So um, there's probably something down there that uh, 
give us a better idea as to why all these uh, stone uh, miniature columns are located there. Here's more pictures of those. Uh, we also took a collection of ceramics there and with the help of uh, uh, doctors of uh, Fadati um, and Visione, uh, identified some of these as potentially uh, BMAC or GKC shirts as well, as well as other things that are uh, probably belong to the Bronze Age. Uh, between those two sites is another one called Chorgun Bad, which is a series of um, uh, Muslim cemeteries. Uh, in those, we found two more pieces of these broken columns and found additional ones in another site called Jali Robot, which is on the border uh, between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, just, uh, just short of shy of the Pakistani border. This is about 30 kilometers south of the, of the Shila Rood in the Fedezira, and is just in the edge of the mountains, very close to the area where the bronze. Uh, 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 metal veins are. Well, we found here a huge collection of uh, smelting, a huge smelting site that goes on for hectares and hectares. And you can see by the photo here that there were piles of, of copper slag as much as four meters high and maybe a hundred meters long in this in, in this area. So that we know there's this, this was an enormous copper smeltery. We tried to take some um, carbon dates here and found only carbon dates dating to for the first millennium CE. But given the fact that on one of the graves there, we found these same kind of travertine vessels that we found elsewhere in, uh, in this region and more of these miniature columns, it would not be surprising if this particular site or sites nearby were smelting copper back in the Bronze Age. So in summary, this area between the Helmand River and uh, the Iranian border is very similar to the kinds of things that we have in, in Iran. Uh, the, the ceramics look the same. The, there are these, these uh, miniature columns and other things that belong to the BMAC culture. And there's, we don't have any large sites. We only have a couple of small ones, but it looks like it's an appendage to what is much better known from Iran and which you are all very familiar with. So let's move into the Helmand Valley, which of course is the what most people want to know about. Well, the Helmand Valley was um, not very well studied until Norman Hammond went there in 1966 and did a survey for a month, uh, and which was published a few years later. He only found one site that he claimed to be bronze, that had painted Bronze Age pottery. Uh, it has been reassessed by uh, Roland Benceval and Henri uh, Paul Francfort uh, to find other material which uh, was this uh, cord marked where, which is also, they claim Bronze Age, and therefore added the number of sites, uh, another additional sites, Bronze Age sites to, uh, to what uh, um, Frank uh, Hammond found. When we went there, um, we were looking also for Bronze Age material, obviously like everyone else. Uh, our, in our first season, we came to a site called Kali Sirak, and as you can see, that's sort of on the, uh, right-hand part of the curve of the Helmand River. Uh, it's an enormous site, uh, over 200 uh, meters on a side, and it rises as much as 30, the Citadel, which is here in the foreground, on the south rises as much as 30 meters above, above ground level. And you can see it's a human construction, these 30 meters. You can see by the, uh, the brick construction down below that and the size of this, of the uh, material, of the base, of this later this the Islamic period fortress on the top, but we know there's an enormous tepe of some sort down below. And having found things that are Bronze Age pottery in our survey on, on the surface, we can only assume that the site goes back to the Bronze Age in some fashion or another. Uh, it will take an enormous amount of work to do a proper excavation of this place, and we only surveyed it on the surface, but the fact that there's Bronze Age pottery there gives us some uh, uh, reason for assuming that this is a Bronze Age site. Uh, as we went across the river, there is an Islamic cemetery, and on one of those graves is again another one of these miniature columns, which further uh, con concretizes the idea that there's, there's Bronze Age in this particular area. We've only found a few other scraps of prehistoric pottery in, in a few sites along, in our studies along the uh, Helmand River, which was less than systematic, because uh, of the difficulties in doing work there, uh, both human difficulties and environmental difficulties. 
Uh, one of them called uh, Hua Justice Hassan by, um, by Hammond, we went and, and revisited and have also been revisited by the only survey that has gone since then, a man named Mark Abramiak, who was with the US military, an archeologist, was working with him in Lashkarga and got permission by his commanding officer to do some surveying along the Helmand River. He went back and found, refound the same site and did a ceramic collection. We tried to do one too, but when we got there, there was a guard on the site who saw us picking up pottery, decided that we were looters and dra dragged us down to the police station. We never got back to collect our material. But our notes from the site say that there, is bron there were Bronze Age sherds within the collection that we had there on this site, which has uh, also a Buddhist stupa and a more recent uh, Muslim uh, ziyarat on top. Uh, again, we can't confirm that. We have a Bromex uh, pottery and Hammond's pottery. There are a couple of pieces that look to be Bronze Age, but we don't have a, as a strong a collection as we would like to be able to be able to make for this. We did one excavation in the, uh, of a possible Bronze Age site in the Helmon Valley, a site called Latkala in the uh, uh, Gazetteer, Afghanistan. We were called, it was called Konakala when we were there. Uh, it's a very small site. It has um, it's less than a hectare in size, about a dozen meters, 14 meters above the plain. It's near Rudbar, which is right in the middle of the Helmon Valley. We did trenches on uh, both the northern and southern sides of it. And here's a, uh, the basic uh, stratigraphic profile. On the top, the top was flattened off and there's occupational material that goes back down this bottom material is, is probably acumented. Then a huge set of stone, of, uh, of mud brick, a uh, uh, platform or walls, very thick and very large, as you can see, going all the way down to the surface. And then, as I mentioned before, we even dug below the modern surface as much as four meters to find cultural materials far that deep. What I want to focus on is this area right in here because it might tell us something about the Bronze Age. There is a large platform, we believe, this area called D3, which continues down to E1 there. Uh, the one, this area C1 over here may be part of it or maybe part of a later one, but there's an enormous platform that underlies this site. It was built upon by a later mud brick uh, wall here, this one called D1, and then a Paxa wall on top of that called D4. But you'll notice there's an occupation level between D1 and D3, which we call D2. If we look at what we found there in that very narrow occupation level, all we found was pottery that we identify as belonging to the early Iron Age. And I'll explain to you why as we get to the later part of this conversation, but this is what we have, this is what we have from uh, that one level. And if there's only early Iron Age pottery sitting on top of that platform, that platform either has to date to the early Iron Age or has to date to the Bronze Age. Uh, this, the, the bricks that we have that were found both in that trench and in the other trench on the Northern side where we found the same kind of large platform, uh, all, all are all long uh, rectangular of the sizes that were known from, uh, from the Bronze Age and from the early Iron Age, but, are, but, but disappear once you get to Akamanid times. So again, we think we have either an early Iron Age or possibly a Bronze Age platform. And the fact that we found Bronze Age pottery on it, what we believe to be Bronze Age pottery, helps cement the idea that this, may be, this particular platform may go back to the Bronze Age. This particular piece is probably was found, unfortunately, in fill. We found no Bronze Age levels at the site. We didn't get deep enough to be able to do that. But this polychrome uh, globular jar with this highly burnished surface, uh, there are lots of parallels to it, similar things in uh, both Harappan period and post-Harappan period in, uh, in the Indo-Iranian borderlands. A few of them here. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on this, so if any of you have a a good idea of what this might be and help me uh, identify it more closely, that would be useful. We also found a few other sherds out of the same kind of ware, this highly polished ware that do not belong to that vessel, those are there on the right. Um, again, we've, there are parallels of similar looking things that go back to 3000 BC and also to post Harappan early second millennium context in, uh, in Baluchistan. Uh, I don't know which one is the closest one to this particular uh, the one that we uh, that we have found. We also found other painted wares in our excavation there. Again, everything came out of fill. Uh, these painted wares, some of them look to be Bronze Age from my uh, limited knowledge of the Bron of Bronze Age pottery here. And so we believe that again, we have a Bronze Age level, but we just don't have any, uh, we just never, go never reached it. 
But what it leaves us is the question of where is the Helmand civilization that the Helmand Valley is supposed to be the center of? Uh, we don't have anything that looks like Shari Sokhtan. If there was a site that had the kind of size and dimensions, certainly someone, either ourselves or the, uh, the scholars before us or after us, would have likely found it. Um, there are likely to be Bronze Age sites, as we can tell from Kala Sarak, that we can tell from um, uh, Lot Kala, um, that, are, that probably have Bronze Age materials. But, it, but thinking through again, the fact that the Helmand gets uh, flooded every year and there's an enormous growth of, of, uh, of material on top of what was once the Bronze Age ground surface uh, helps us believe that there probably are Bronze Age um, layers underneath some of these uh, tepes that are standing in the Helmand Valley now, like this one that uh, 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 was photographed by Abrami. To help fill it, the picture, was, it would be good to go and reassess Nadia Ali, which uh, was originally claimed by uh, Gershman, who first excavated it to be a, a median Achaemenid site and with later materials on top of it. Uh, he, he too found a platform at the bottom. Uh, George Dale re-excavated it and found that the platform went another 15 meters below so that this entire 30 meter high site is probably one huge platform. Uh, when Fair Survey surveyed it in 1949, he looked not only at uh, Sork Dog, which, is where, which was excavated, but also Safed Dog, which is another mound right next to it, and found a broader collection of pottery uh, than what was found in the excavation, some of which might be Bronze Age material. Um, when Ben Saval and Frankfurt re-looked at Nadia Lee, they found material in the collection from Gershman and Dales, uh, this, primarily this cord, this cord marked material and the hip jars that they claim to be Bronze Age and that they, knowing that there are similar uh, platform sites like that, like during the here, here, um, from the Bronze Age, uh, claim that uh, uh, Nadia Lee is a Bronze Age site. I, I have no reason to doubt them, they know far more than I do. But um, there is some evidence to, for that to, uh, being another Bronze Age site, a large Bronze Age site in Afghanistan. At the other end of the Helmand Valley, we have Kali Beast, uh, Bust that's known to you. Again, a huge mound uh, with the uh, Islamic levels on top, but enormous materials underneath. Uh, we've, uh, Dr. Trousdale published a Achaemenid weight from this site. Uh, there's no reason not to believe that because of its location at the confluence of the Arkandab and Helmand rivers, that it is also does not also have a Bronze Age layer. But in none of the surveyors who have look there, have found one yet. We can also say that the area that is east of the Helmand, the Sarotar Valley, that uh, we spent a significant amount of time in, does not have any Bronze Age remains because we spent a lot of time there and did not find a single Bronze Age shirt. So in summary, again, the, the Bronze Age is hidden. We have a few sites that we know of. We expect that most of what we know for the Bronze Age is probably under the ground, uh, underneath at the bottom of some of the tepes that we have found that have later materials on them, but we only, but only through excavation of probably going all the way down to the to the water level, will be will we ever find the Bronze Age levels? But even so, it's it's less dense Bronze Age occupation that we might have expected from uh, from an area that was called the Helmand civilization, and that's a question I don't don't really have an answer to. Part of the reason that there's this differential ability to see sites may have to do with the path of the of the Helmand River, which in the Bronze Age, most scholars believe went along the Rudy Biban into Iran, and therefore we find lots of sites there. When the river later after the Bronze Age turned to the north, which is what most scholars believe, um, there are more sites that appear to the north of that, that juncture, and the sites that were to the west uh, the Bronze Age sites all be, uh, became uninhabitable because of lack of water, and therefore not only were abandoned, but were not built upon them in later times, simply because there was no water going there, uh, in spite of the fact that there were, there were canals that we know uh, led to this area in, in later times. Uh, again, this still re re brings the puzzle as to why the Ruta Biaban itself does not have more Bronze Age sites. Again, I have, don't have an answer to that, but that may explain why the density of, 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 of sites in Iranian Sistan 
but not in Afghan society. Well, let's move to the Iron Age. We, we know based upon the fact that we have BMAC or Greater Khorasan Culture sites that the Bronze Age moves into the 18th, possibly 17th century in Afghanistan. But there's an article um, written uh, over a decade ago uh, by uh, Dr. Mortazavi called Mind the Gap in English. I'm sure he also has written similar things in, in, uh, in Farsi, where he bemoaned the fact that there was nothing from the end of the Bronze Age uh, until the Achaemenid period in Sistan. Well, when we went back to Saratar, where we spent, again, a significant amount of time in the Saratar region, uh, there were enormous canal systems that, were, that came, came from the Helmand River going eastward into the Saratar Plain, which is a flat plain that is, uh, has soil, has sand, and so on and so forth. But these canals, uh, canal systems uh, ran throughout this area, some of them more than 100 kilometers long that, that watered this area. You can see the size of them from these, these photographs uh, and how, how long they were and how, uh, uh, again, uh, the, the last ones were in the 15th century, but they, they did manage to turn Saratar, this area, this very fertile basin when it's watered into a good uh, uh, occupational area when there's water there. One of the sites we found when we were first there, we called Kala 169, it was covered with painted pottery. Uh, so we went back in 1974, several seasons later and excavated it. Um, this site, uh, Kala, which we labeled Kala 169, has a large uh, mound on the north side, sort of, uh, I think 50 by 80, and then a large uh, enclosure around it with a wall surrounding that about 10 meters high. Uh, that is much larger. The, the mound itself is surrounded by a wall, a casemate wall, and stands probably about 12 meters above the surface. Um, in our excavation, we went, we dug three different trenches through the mound itself, two through the enclosure walls, and then one in the center of the enclosure, number F. And in it, we discovered a variety of things. First of all, the, there's a, uh, a large tower with uh, large rectangular bricks mud bricks on the northeast on top of the mound. Down in the enclosure, we have uh, what are probably later buildings made out of mud brick, uh, either cemeteries or buildings or both. Um, but in excavating the mound itself, we came up with what is essentially a poxa platform here that is at least five, seven, eight meters high, uh, and then probably goes down below the modern ground level that had occupation levels along the side here and on the top of it here. It was later modified and, and added with mud brick. There's a mud brick layer here, another occupation level, another mud brick layer on top, and then finally a mud brick layer, this level one on top. So we have here, uh, and even before this, this uh, POXA platform was built, there's some small occupation levels below. These levels two, three, and four are all seem to be the same cultural level. Uh, level one on top seems to be later. Level one seems to have what we know as Parthian or Sustanian uh, pottery. We have uh, 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 ribbed ware, we have uh, 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 ring burnished ware and so on and so forth that we're very familiar with. But once you get below that level one, that, that cap of, of uh, uh, brick, mud brick, what we found were only these particular kinds of pottery. Painted pottery style that was something that we weren't very familiar with um, that we uh, that, that I'll talk about in just a minute. In 1974, in addition to excavating there, we also did a survey throughout Saratar, and in the course of the survey, we found seven additional sites that had the same kind of pottery on it, and in fact, were very similar in the sense that they had a platform and an enclosure to the southeast of it. This particular one, the largest one, Call 350A, also had an enclosure to the north, but that was unusual for them. Um, again, a platform with two compounds and the same kind of pottery found at Call 169. Call 345, the same, a platform, compound to the southeast. Of, again, the same kind of painted pottery and some burials, including one uh, flexed burial that had a pot of the same sort that was uh, placed behind the head of the deceased. A lot of other complete jars were found, shows that the, this, this site was probably used for lots of burials because of the complete amount of complete pottery found. 
But again, the pottery is the same style that we found at column 169. Column 31, 231, again, the same. Uh, lar a large uh, tepe, same kind of painted pottery. Um, Shari Gogala, which is the largest site we found, it's uh, the palace on top dates probably to the Safarid period. And we dug beneath the palace uh, about four or five meters and found Sasanian and Parthian levels below that. But the Parthian level down here, four meters below the latest palace that's on the surface is still 15 meters above the surface of the ground below. And so there's something beneath that. We found lots of uh, uh, early Iron Age pottery of the same kind of painted type around it, but uh, we don't have any stratigraphic evidence that we're, that Shari Gogla, which are the largest site that we have, was also built on top of a, a early Iron Age platform. But it certainly wouldn't surprise us given what we have seen at these other sites. Uh, Konakala, the site that we excavated in the, in the Helmon Valley, again, I've already mentioned that. Uh, we found the same kind of pottery here, both this painted stuff, and then uh, some uh, more plain wares, which probably call ridged, uh, ridge rim wares, uh, which have these kind of ridges on the outside that were uh, found in association with the painted pottery at all of these sites. Uh, Bacho, Jui now, again in the Helmon Valley, we didn't find painted pottery, but we found this ridged rim ware there as well. And by the time we were done, we had over 20 different sites that have this particular kind of pottery on them, both in the Helmand Valley and to a large extent in uh, uh, Sarotar. Uh, it, also, we found scatters of this, of this painted pottery and this other uh, early Iron Age pottery at various other places without these, uh, uh, these mound sites. Um, so that there's likely either cemeteries or smaller uh, occupational sites uh, in Sarotar that we uh, that, that all that's left of them are these scatterings of pottery. But again, we have a we have a lot enough of these sites that we have to take this seriously as a separate kind of entity. Uh, these sites all have these identical profiles. Here's column 169, which I've already showed you. Another one, column 222, again the, the mound and the uh, uh, enclosure around it. Column 345, mound enclosure around it. Column 350A, mound and closure around it. Again, they all have the same kind of site profiles. They all have this distinctive painted, painted pottery, which has uh, several different kinds of uh, features to it. They, they're, very, they're very well wheel-made pottery. Uh, they have a sandy feeling on the outside, always this sandy appearance. Uh, they're deliberately overfired. Many of them are gray or even vitrified green. Uh, the wares uh, are so large, a lot of them are dark red. Uh, they're evenly fired to a sort of metallic finish. The, bowl, the shapes are simple bowls, simple jars. Uh, a percentage of them are painted, but a large percentage of them are not. And they have generally monochrome, uh, monochrome bands with uh, patterns of uh, triangles, hatches, lots of little festoons, dotted circles, little suns sometimes. But again, a, a, very, a very distinct vocabulary that is familiar, each, each piece of which is familiar from the region, but together they all sort of form a corpus that we haven't seen anywhere else. Um, and I'll show you the problems here. Of the plain work materials and also some of the painted materials, the bases are often string cut or cut in some fashion. And very often they're, they're uh, finished off at the bottom by hand, as you can see with this particular one. The uh, ridge rim jars and basins are also very common from these sites. As you can see from three or four different sites, we find the same kind of ridge rimming in, the, in these large basins and in jars. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, another type of this is hip jars, that kind of very similar to what uh, Essenval and uh, uh, Frankfurt uh, claimed are Bronze Age ones. We find these in the Iron Age as well. Uh, again, with the same kind of rim. One of them was found actually in situ at, at one of these sites that we surveyed. And we found lots of pieces of them in, in other sites. We found two pieces of grayware. And if we're talking about something going to the early Iron Age, that wouldn't be surprising. But so few, only two pieces. One of them was a, a, uh, a piece with a spout. Another one was a, was a rim. Uh, a, a very uh, a Bronze Age piece that uh, uh, we call it a spearhead, but we have no idea really what it was. It's uh, punctured and along the edge. Uh, these two very nice uh, stone pieces from two different sites. Um, uh, they've been called spindle whirls. If they were from Calculatic times, we would have called them mace heads. Again, we don't know really what these are. Uh, again, I would welcome your help if you 
are familiar with things from other sites that are similar to these. They're very well made. They do not like they look like they were used. Uh, this one is probably from local stone. This one is probably from farther away. This is uh, the kind of basalt that is found in the area around Kuikwaja. Brick sizes, again, are uh, similar to what is known from uh, the bricks in, for example, Turkmenistan. They are uh, rectangular bricks with sort of 135, 136 kind of ratio. Uh, the tower had much larger bricks, which might be Sasanian, we don't really know. But for all the way down to level two, three, and four, have this very similar size bricks that fit the brick sizes that we know from Turkmenistan and possibly other sites as well. Um, this large size is the kind that's also found in Nadi Ali from if this is a Bronze Age uh, site, uh, it matches uh, what we have on the uh, uh, on the top of uh, Kala 169. But again, Vesaval uh, uh, and uh, Frankfurt were nice enough to make a nice table of very many sites that had those. And a large number of the Bronze Age sites they, they found have very similar in their pottery, uh, their uh, brick sizes to what we have in Kala 169. So in summary, uh, the early iron sites are located along the canals in Saratar. They're plat platforms with walled compounds. Uh, the platform is usually on the Northwest to protect the lower parts from, from the wind. There are smaller sites. Uh, we, have, we have burials with, uh, that usually contain probably one or more of these uh, uh, small uh, painted jars. Um, brick sizes are consistent with early Iron Age sites. Uh, very little uh, iron, bronze and, all, and no iron found and other kinds of objects that seem to be um, uh, of interest. In looking for uh, the pottery, again, I've already described. Here's a sort of summary of what we have here. We took a bunch of carbon dates, not knowing what this, uh, this culture was. And the carbon dates are all over the place. Uh, we have some that date as late as the second century BCE, some as early as the 17th century, the 16th century BCE. Most of them tend to circle around the year 1000 BCE. So this is why we have given this a early Iron Age date, even though the, the range of, of uh, carbon dates that we have is so vast. Uh, if you take the year 1000, that's probably the, the median but it's uh, certainly, uh, 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 we have a lot of later dates and some earlier dates as well. In trying to create comparisons, it's, it's difficult. And those of you who try to sort out the early Iron Age in this whole area from Eastern Iran to the North and the South and to the East of it, um, we found these, the same kind of problem. Um, going back to re-examine once again, Nadia Ali, Sefi Dog, which, uh, was one of the two mounds. The, the one that was excavated was Sork Dog, but Sefi Dog is one that Fersavis visited. And the kind of pottery he found there was very similar in his description of the kind that we have from the early Iron Age. So there, that in fact may be an early Iron Age mound. If you look at Dale's report, he talks mostly about this particular kind of pottery, which he calls A2 pottery, which is bichrome, which he labels to the median dates or to the uh, Achaemenid times. But there's another one that he doesn't talk about, but he separates out a kind of painted pottery he calls A3 pottery, which looks much more like the kind of material that we have from, uh, from uh, Sarotar. Um, Uta Franke, who gave the talk here a couple of uh, weeks ago, talked about there being an early Iron Age uh, level in the city of Herat. Again, her, her dates overlap our dates, but the ceramics that she found look extremely different from the kinds of things that we have found in Sarotar. Uh, there is a platform at the base of uh, one of the areas in the excavation at Kandahar that is beneath the Achaemenid level. But just as we have a Paksa platform for our early Iron Age stuff, there's a, a Paksa platform at the bottom of Kandahar, but again, they reach the water table there and don't have any pottery associated with this, this platform. But Mundagak, which is nearby, which is also supposed to be one of these sites that stretches from the end of the Bronze Age through the Achaemenid period. Again, their pottery from Mundagak 6 to Mundagak 7 is very different from the kind of stuff that we found in Saratar. Same thing with Parak, another site in Baluchistan, which just stretches from this, that supposedly covers part of this range. We also don't find anything that's very similar uh, to what we have in Saratar. And if we look in Turkmenistan, 
Uh, for example, Yaztepe 1 type of pottery, uh, Yaztepe 2 has very little in the way of painted ware. Yaztepe 1 has some similarities, but it's a very coarse handmade ware and not at all similar to what we have either, even though they're building on platforms much as the kind of platforms that we have uh, from, uh, from Sarotar. Uh, there may be similarities in the burials. The one burial we have has parallels in uh, Turkmenistan as well. And the ridged coursewares that we have is found in Achaemenid sites. Um, it was found at Kandahar, Nadi Ali, and Dani Gulaban, uh, as I've shown here. But it, it may give us uh, more, may mean that this style stretches for several centuries predating the Achaemenid period um, in, in, this, in, the, uh, in the Sistan region. So do we have an early Iron Age culture? Well, I think the best answer so far is from Joanna um, uh, Loudier, who wrote, despite the fact that painted ware cultures belong to the same cultural community, recent research shows that far from being a homogeneous block, they were homogeneous, they were autonomous and often very contrasting. It may well be that, as she claims, there are local regional styles that do not match with each other, but do in fact occupy the same chronological time or similar chronological times. There's enough similarities with what we have that might match what uh, have been found in other places uh, in uh, uh, Turkmenistan, in the in, in Baluchistan, in Eastern Iran, but nothing that, but they don't all, they don't all fit well together, which is, uh, uh, which is a problem. And uh, uh, again, I don't have an answer to this other than the fact that we do seem to have a culture from our carbon dates and from uh, the uh, kinds of material we have, we believe it dates to uh, some centuries uh, early in the uh, first millennium or late in the second millennium BCE, but we can't give you any better uh, uh, guidance than that um, because we don't, we don't have uh, the kind of information or the kind of parallels that make it easy to, uh, uh, to compare and contrast. Again, uh, some of you know more about this material than I do, and I would welcome your comments in just a minute. Um, uh, just uh, in closing, uh, this, uh, we began the Helmand Siston project in 1971, which is a, even 50 years ago. And 50 years after the fact, the first volume of it will finally appear. Uh, it is in press now with Edinburgh University Press. Uh, it will appear next summer sometime. Uh, Bill Trousdale and I are the co-authors. Uh, we've had help from uh, numerous other people. Uh, this will be mostly the description of the various sites that we have, which there's uh, almost 200 of them. Volume two, which will have the descriptions of the pottery and the smaller finds and more on the geology and environment and inscriptions and so on and so forth. Uh, those will appear in uh, uh, probably in 2023. And that's what I'm working on writing right now. Uh, there are other sources for material on the Helmand Siston project before these books come out. Uh, a couple of lectures I've given on the, broadly on the project. There'll be a web, public facing website that'll be available next year. Uh, the Iron Age description is uh, in a paper that appeared in the journal Afghanistan. Uh, there is in press a uh, paper on the Bronze Age that will be in a festschrift, supposed to be published next year, uh, and more conference presentations that are on my Academia EDU site. In any case, um, that's all I have to say. And I appreciate your sitting and listening to me for such a long time. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. <laughs>